Good evening. The TED stage is famous for the presentation of new ideas, but I'm here this evening to promote an ancient one, the idea that people are part of nature. For many people, that statement that people are part of nature would seem needlessly redundant. If we were to pick a single cultural group from roughly this region, the Iroquois, for example, we would find great proof. Iroquois society for centuries has been organized by a system of matriarchal clans. And those clans bear names like wolf, deer, turtle, hawk, and heron. This isn't mascot stuff at all. It's much, much deeper than that. The clan names are evidence of a close and reverent identification with wildlife. Literally evidence that the Iroquois people recognize a shared history on a shared planet. By contrast, in our busy lives, nature is something that we separate from ourselves, that we choose to visit or to avoid, something we might watch on television or find in a book or in a magazine, not something in our everyday lives. Depending upon our personal experience, nature might be something of high interest, of total indifference, or even of fear. On the grand scale of accepting our role in nature, the importance of it is, is profound. Um, accepting yourself as part of nature on the grand scale means identifying ourself as a biological species on this planet, occupying a very narrow life zone. And it's a life zone that we do not fully understand the interactions of or the threats to. On a individual scale, on the personal level, things are much brighter. Recognizing our kinship in nature is an opportunity for each of us to at least occasionally rekindle interest in the world just around us to the interest level of a toddler. And that's a very good thing. That would make all of our lives beneficial. A renowned scientist who has thought and written much about our place in nature is Edward O. Wilson. He's better known as E.O. Wilson. He's an evolutionary biologist, the author of some 30 books, professor emeritus at Harvard University, and at the age 88, he is the leading expert on the 12,000 ant species in the world. That, that doesn't fully capture him, though. He's an Alabama native who thrived in the jungles of Malaysia, the mountains of Mexico, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And that's an amazing thing. He actually coined a term, a new word, called biophilia, in one of his 30 books has that title. And he says in biophilia, before the quote that's up there, something that is extraordinary. He identifies our connection to the other organisms on the planet. He says they are the matrix in which the human mind originated and is permanently rooted. That makes him a philosopher of pretty high standard. He describes our current widespread separation from nature as nothing less than an, in lo a loss of enchantment. And that's that toddler level engagement I was talking about earlier. Loss of enchantment with the world around us. But he doesn't leave us stranded there. He offers a prescription for becoming re-enchanted. And that's the quote you see up there. To the extent that each person can feel like a naturalist, the old excitement of the untrammeled world will be regained. That directive brings us to this turkey vulture. I figured there was a 50-50 shot when he was set out here, he was facing the right way. I'm glad I didn't bet money on that. At first consideration, the vulture doesn't neatly fit Wilson's formula. It's, it's not minute. It is certainly not uh, a creature of splendor. And at this time of year, there are none within walking distance of where you're sitting. And also, in case you're wondering, the very same question that any first grader would be wondering, wondering it's not alive. And if you're wondering the very same questions that at least some fourth graders wonder, I didn't kill it. I don't know who killed it. 
I don't know what kind of weapon was involved when it died, but it was more than 50 years ago. The bird has had a tremendous afterlife as an education specimen. What this vulture can do, though, is help us understand how feeling like a naturalist can lead us to recognize our place in nature. A definition of that term naturalist is in order here, and a simple definition will suffice. A naturalist is simply a person who studies or is an expert in some aspects of nature. The term has a special relevance to me because in my day-to-day -day work, I supply manor materials that, to paraphrase Wilson, can help someone feel like a naturalist. I'm an educator at Carnegie Museum of Natural History, and I effectively manage what is our region's largest show and tell collection. Rocks, minerals, fossils, dried plants, preserved insects, and taxidermy mounts. That's the technical term for the form of this 50 years dead turkey vulture. A big part of my job is to loan these materials to teachers and librarians, to get them in classrooms, in libraries, and after school programs, in camps, scout programs, and to work with the people, the professionals on that end, to interpret the materials. Almost any item in the collection could serve as a focal point for seeing ourselves in nature. I could have selected a bird with more charisma for the TED stage, a penguin, an owl, even a tiny hummingbird. But the turkey vulture seemed to offer a kind of honesty, a transparency about the often gory and gross aspects of nature. And both the turkey vulture and I have kind of the bald head thing going on, so it's a pretty good selection there. They are truly special birds. Among an estimated 10,000 bird species in the world, only 22 species are vultures. By comparison, there are 200 species of owls, more than 200 species of owls, and hummingbirds account for at least 300 species. The turkey vulture is a good example for a naturalist material because it offers a close-up view of something that uh, is pretty common to see from a distance. Were this a summer afternoon instead of a winter evening, we could, from where you're sitting, easily walk to a place where we could probably see three or four soaring turkey vultures, probably from the path on the river's edge, not far from where you are sitting. What the bird in the box offers, though, is a chance to get up close, to get an inches away view of the less often seen, the business end of that bird. Turkey vultures are scavengers. And when the birds, when the audience is directed to examine features and to literally report what they see, they notice the big hooked beak, that large nose opening, and especially the bare bald head. These are adaptations. And in the sense we're talking about, those are features that are inherited generation to generation that are selected for survival. Survival on a day-to-day -day basis, survival on a year-to-year -year basis, for thousands and thousands of generations. So in some way or another, what we're looking at there in physical features helps that bird survive to at least breeding age to where the features are passed along. We're talking about evolution here, but because that scientific term is still saddled with hints of political disagreement, the very best teachers become very efficient at explaining the process, having students identify features, be able to talk about them, and yet they simply call it change over time. The knowledge is still transferred, the, the process is still identified, the learning goes on. Well, let's briefly examine a few vulture adaptations. The wingspan of a turkey vulture can be all of six feet. And one of those birds with an empty belly probably only weighs somewhere between two pounds and four pounds. So a six foot wingspan with those feathers, the bird can fly long distances with very, very little effort. They are, they are amazing flyers. We could term, use the, the term splendor to describe the bird in flight. 
The bird's Latin name uh, refers to that. Cathartes aura. It means breezy cleanser. The cleanser has to do with what the bird does in feeding on dead carcasses. By, by cleaning up carcasses from the landscape, the birds minimize the buildup of harmful bacteria and even viruses in soil and in water. From those effortless flights, the bird's keen sense of smell can detect a rotting carcass hundreds of feet below it, even when they're concealed by vegetation. When the bird's able to locate and land and feed on a carcass, the hooked beak does wonders, but that bare head allows the bird to feed on the rotting interior, on organ meats instead of just muscle tissue without getting its head dirty. Discussions of turkey vulture adaptations, even the gory ones, opens an intellectual door for us to reflect upon ourselves, what our adapt adaptations are as humans. Our upright stance, our binocular vision, the amazing dexterity of our hands and fingers, our ability to speak and to sing, and most of all, our large brains. Brains that have made us a self-aware, tool-making, art-creating, landscape-shaping species. This pattern, introspection on our condition through knowledge of a other organism, and other organisms we can include plants, funguses, viruses in that, is what leads us to see our place in nature. So what Wilson suggests about leaving where you're sitting and going out and looking, it can have profound effect. Nature membership entails responsibility to support the system's health. That's easier said than done. In the example I have of how even well-meaning human actions can have drastic negative consequences is a vulture-related exhibit. Turkey vulture populations in our area are doing fine. In terms of status, the bird is termed least concern in biological circles, circles, meaning so far so good, the thing seems to be thriving. By contrast, in India, in this century, and in fact in the first eight years of the 21st century, vulture populations, six different species, plummeted 99%. The culprit was a veterinary drug used in cows and cattle to reduce inflammation. Any vultures that fed on cow carcasses that early in their lives had been treated with that drug were affected. Their kidney function completely shut down. There was no recovery. Action by the Indian government and other private organizations have banned that drug, and there seems to be recover recovery beginning in vulture populations, but there was a negative human impact. With vulture decline, car cow carcasses piled up Stray dog populations went up with the cow carcasses as a new food source and rabies went up. So rabies became a problem in a lot of villages because of the vulture decline. As a dealer in naturalist materials, I don't work in isolation. For more than the past year, I've been part of a small team of museum staff and researchers from the University of Pittsburgh working on a project called 21st Century Naturalist. We're examining how people become naturalists in our digital age. We're looking at the use of new technology, how important mentors are, the critical role, it seems so far, in simple unstructured time outside, especially for children. And most importantly, we've been learning the value of seeking diverse cultural pers perspectives about nature. My contributions to this study effort have largely involved relaying information from the teachers and librarians and scout leaders who, who use the material I provide and passing that information to the team. And in doing that, I've become aware of a seldom discussed barrier to acceptance of the idea I'm promoting, the idea that people are part of nature. More than once at a teacher workshop, a participant has asked me how viewing ourselves as a product of evolution interferes with our relationship with God. Although belief in evolution is at odds with a literal 
interpretation of the biblical creation story. I need to be clear here that nothing I've said or implied here is intend to, intended to lessen anyone's religious faith. The techniques of science cannot prove or disprove the existence of a supreme being. And if there's some concept implied here, what I hope it is, is that we are not God. The historic quote that best applies here as a signal of respect to all listeners concerns naturalist and writer Henry David Thoreau. Thoreau was someone whose deep connection to nature was anchored in lived experience. And he sheer, shared his belief that people are part of nature in published journals and essays. Journals and essays that are still in print more 150 years after Thoreau's death. In 1862, as Thoreau lay dying of tuberculosis at age 44, his family brought a minister to his bedside. When the minister asked, Henry, have you made your peace with God? Thoreau replied simply, I didn't know we'd quarreled. Thank you.